So go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 12, and we will be uh, looking at the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into, um, into Jerusalem, something that he came to earth to do, uh, that he knew he was going to do, uh, and in the book of John, it focuses on his journey there. Now, um, I'll tell you, in all of the Gospels, this is the account of the triumphal, triumphal entry, but in all of the Gospels, you'll find this account, and you'll find those accounts in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, Luke 19, verses 28 through 44, and of course here in John chapter 12, start, or John... John chapter 12, starting with verse 12, as uh, he enters into the city. And the name of the uh, sermon today is Hosanna. And I've already told you a little bit about what Hosanna means, but uh, it was a time in Jerusalem where uh, they were looking for the Messiah. They had been looking for him for a long time. Did you catch it in the children's song where they were climbing the ladder for 400 years? Because there was that silence between uh, the last prophet and, and Jesus' arrival. And uh, they had been um, in bondage for many years. First the Greeks and then the Romans had uh, taken over the land. They had, they had lost their land because of their disobedience. Uh, they had come back under Nehemiah. They, they uh, had tried to reestablish, but they never reestablished the kingdom that they had uh, before under David and Solomon and then the succeeding kings after that. And uh, their nation just kept getting worse and worse as they kept falling farther and farther into sin. But, but once they had gone into exile uh, and they came back into the land, they never went back to that sin of idolatry that got them kicked out of the land, but they were, they were now looking for the Savior to come. They were looking for him to free them and to free them from the bondage of Rome and to give them uh, a kingdom like they had had before and to return them to the glory that they had once uh, enjoyed or at least this group could only imagine but they knew their history and they had uh, been a great kingdom at one time and they wanted that glory again. Do you understand uh, a little bit about that? They weren't asking for God to to return and take them home. They were asking him to come back and restore the glory that they had rather than the glory that was due God. You see, even their focus was, was off. They were looking at what the Messiah could do for them rather than what he was gonna do about them and about you and I. And that's really the story of Jesus Why did he come? He came for you and I. He didn't come to do something for us. He came to do something about us because we had been separated. And in that, going to the cross, he made a way for us to come back because he loved us. And and so we see that uh, this is found in all four Gospels. And in the book of John especially, it's, it's... A beautiful book. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are known as what's called the Synoptic Gospels. They are an account after account after account. But John is more of a biography. It's more of a a telling of John's time with Jesus in a very personal and intimate way. And and, uh, when a new Christian uh, comes to faith and they say, where do I start in the Bible? You say, go to the book of John because it's a love story. And as we look at this story, the way John frames the triumphal entry, he frames it against his preparation for his burial. Up in uh, chapter, or verse 1 of chapter 12, uh, he's, um, it's six days before the Passover. Uh, they've come to Bethany where Lazarus was, uh, was, and he's raised him from the dead. And then you get down uh, to verse 6, and it starts, or in verse 4, Judas Iscariot is um, intending to betray him, but he's upset because uh, Mary is going to prepare Jesus for burial. And uh, it's, verse 7 says, uh, after she's poured out this uh, fragrant oil on his feet and wiped it with her hair, 
Judas is upset and he says, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. She's prepared me for what is to come with this perfume. And so the triumphal entry on the front end is framed by his burial and being prepared for that. And on the back end, he gives the parable of the grain of wheat. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so John has framed this triumphal entry between the preparation for burial and Jesus saying, listen, I have to go die. I have to die for you. I have to do this. And so we pick it up with verse 12. If you would, please stand in honor, honor of reading God's word as we uh, start with verse 12 and read through verse 19. I'm reading from the New American Standard. The words are on the screen. I hope that you can read them. Uh, on the next day, the large crowd who had come into the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And these things the disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. And so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, well, they continued to testify about him. And for this reason also the people went and they met him because they had heard that he had performed this sign. And so the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you're not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. You may be seated. The first thing that you see here is there was going to be a parade. Now, Jesus had been in his ministry for three years. He had been to Jerusalem before, but on this last time, he's coming in um, during one of the feasts. There's going to be this parade. Uh, it's a large crowd that has gathered in Jerusalem. The Passover is coming. We already know that it's six days away or five days away, and Jesus is going there to celebrate the Passover, and he is, he is going there to his death, and he knows it. And there's this large crowd that begins to gather. There's this parade that's going to be there. And uh, Josephus was a uh, Jewish historian, but he was also a Roman citizen. And so he was considered a Roman historian, a secular uh, historian, that estimated that during the Passover of Jesus' time, there was roughly two and a half million people that would descend on Jerusalem. Now we see cities like New York, we see cities like Houston, we see cities like Los Angeles, and we say, well that doesn't sound like a whole lot. Well you think about a city like Jerusalem in that day, 2,000 years ago, what two and a half million people descending on that city would have been like to celebrate the Passover and the Feast of Booths and, and all of the things that were gonna be taking place during Jesus' time there. That was a big crowd. And they had heard about Jesus. And so when they hear that he's entering the city, they pick up the palm branches. And, and all of you have probably been in church a lot and you've, you've been through a lot of uh, Palm Sundays and Easter Sundays. And, and you know that I'm talking about the palm branches were there. But you know, there's a move today to say, well, they didn't have enough palm branches to do what the Bible says. Just one more attempt to try to say that uh, the Bible's untrue. And, and it's true that Jerusalem is at 2,470-something feet uh, elevation. It's, it's high enough that it can actually snow there. But the palm tree was intertwined within the culture of the Jews. There were reliefs carved onto the temple of palm branches. The palm branch was on the, the Jewish shekel. It was, it was throughout their literature and history that uh, it was important to them. 
And granted, it may not have been the type of uh, palm trees you see on a tropical island, but it was the type of palm that produced a fruit called a date, which was a large, uh, it was a big staple food in their diet. And it's estimated that the place was covered with palm trees at the time. And so there would have been ample supply of these branches for, for the crowd to go and gather and to, to lift them up and to begin to welcome in the king as he entered in Jerusalem. And you can imagine the scene that was there. They were welcoming a king. That was the focus. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and they began to shout, Hosanna! I tried to get y'all guys to do it, but y'all didn't want to do it. So you had to leave it up to me. Only one of you passed the test over there. But imagine however many people were lining the road that Jesus was, was walking, coming up to Jerusalem. Imagine how many people there were screaming, Hosanna! Blessed be Jesus who's coming in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the King. Now, y'all aren't used to me yelling at you, and I know that. But you got to get a flavor of what was going on. And the closest thing that I can come to since they let me down, the closest thing that I can come to is you're at the championship game and your team is in that game and you're on the sidelines and you're winning and you are just losing your mind as you're yelling for your team to win. You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of y'all do that in front of your TV. If you can't be at the game, you lose your mind in front of the TV. But understand this, this was a people that was oppressed. They had not seen the glory. They had never seen the glory that they read about. They had God's word as keepers of that. They knew their history. They understood why they lost their kingdom. They knew that they had been disobedient. They realized that God had kept his promises and when they were disobedient, he had kicked them out of the land and then he had brought them back just as he said he would. They understood that God had given them and promised them this land and here they were in the land and yet the Roman oppressors were there. And all of a sudden there was the promise of a king. There was the promise of of a return to the former glory that they had never experienced, but that they had only read about. There was a promise of the return to what they once were. And they were losing their minds. They were losing their minds. The focus of the crowd was that they were ushering in a king. Hosanna, blessed is he, who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. This was a huge event. And it wasn't just one time that you're yelling Hosanna. They were yelling this over and over and over again. And they were calling him the King of Israel. They were saying that he was coming because he was the Lord's anointed. They were expecting him to be the Messiah, although they didn't know what the Messiah had come to do. They were seeing him as their savior, although they didn't understand what that salvation would really mean. They were seeing him as the military leader that could kick Rome out, return them to their glory, and they would take their place in history once again as God's people. This was a very emotional event for them. And it's the very same crowd that began yelling, crucify him, just a few days later. Maybe because they were whipped into it, maybe because Jesus wasn't doing what they expected him to do, maybe because the crowd hadn't been able to sway him to take the throne. They thought he was going to march into Jerusalem and take the seat, and all of a sudden the Roman uh, invaders would be gone and, and Jerusalem would be the seat of their 
their capital again and, and it just wasn't turning out the way they wanted it to. And gosh, after eight, waiting 400 more, or plus years to have the kingdom restored, they were a little impatient. And so they're yelling this. You see the praise in verse 13, the second part of verse 13, when they begin to yell, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we see this praise being shouted out, and that, that phrase, Hosanna, means salvation now. It's not just that they were uh, happy that he was coming down and, and entering into Jerusalem. They were going, I want salvation now. You, you need to take the kingship. I want you to return us to our glory. We are here. We're behind you, Jesus. I want you to provide what we expect. Isn't that the way we do today sometimes? We expect Jesus to attend to our needs. But we should be attending to his commands. Amen. It's not about what he can do for us. Jesus is not a Kmart special. Blue light special over here on aisle five. Need a new car need to pass this test need you to strike my boss down with lightning need you to have the preacher end on time we do that we demand of Jesus and even the irony of it is not lost on me as I read this account as they're shouting salvation now the irony is not lost on me they're shouting this about a king and the whole purpose of having a king is that you serve him he doesn't serve you although Jesus came to serve he did that willingly he does that willingly he went to a cross willingly because he loved us but we should give back to him because of what he's done for us. And so this praise is being lifted up. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Needless to say, they were excited. Now, this term, king of Israel, and the savior of the world is what they really were, were implying it's not an unusual term. John had already recorded it in chapter 1, verse 49, as Nathaniel had identified Jesus as the king of Israel. He said, surely you're the king of Israel. And the, the Samaritans in chapter 4, verse 42, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he tells her all of the things she's ever done, and she goes back to the city, and she tells, hey, listen, come see this man that told me everything that I've ever done. And they come back and they see him. Go to the account in chapter 4. And they sit there and said, we believe because she told us, but now we believe because we've seen you truly are the Savior of the world. John had already recorded that. Jesus had already said it. When, Peter asked, when he asked Peter, who do people say that I am? He said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus had already declared who he was. He had already made it clear that he was the Messiah. And that as such, he is the Savior of the world. And he is the King of Israel. Just not in the way that they wanted it to, to come about. But as you keep looking at this, they wouldn't be silenced. It's a fairly long trek along the road that is traditionally known as the way Jesus would have come into Jerusalem. And it's a fairly good amount of real estate there that the crowds would have been lining. And he would have been coming up, seated on this donkey, and they would have been screaming this the whole way. 30, 40 minutes worth. Maybe even longer. Depends on if the crowds were in front of him and if he had to make a way through them. 
they would not be silenced. Granted, their understanding was, was not correct. But I wonder, church, why are we so easily silenced? We know the king. We've met him. If you call him your personal savior, he's become real to you. And he's called us to be witnesses. It's interesting that they would not be silenced. You know, even when the Pharisees told them to stop in, chap- in Luke chapter 19, you know what Jesus said to them? Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, he says, I tell you, if these become silent, the very rocks would cry out. And I believe it, don't you? If he can command the wind and the waves, don't you think he could make the rocks cry out? By the way, that's just not a nice saying. If Jesus really could command the wind and the waves to stop, he could command the rocks to cry out. And they would. They would not be silenced, and yet the church today is so silent. We know the king, and yet we don't proclaim him. They didn't know who Jesus really was. They thought he was the king to come to free them from Rome, and you couldn't shut them up. Shouldn't we be that excited about Jesus, especially in this Easter season? And I'm going to put this in there right now. Easter is coming up, and every one of you knows somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Every one of you knows somebody that needs to hear the message of Easter. Every one of you needs to to, to find that person and proclaim who Jesus is and say, won't you come with me? Won't you be a part of that to this Easter? And then on the Sunday after that, still continue to proclaim who Jesus is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And not stop proclaiming it until he calls you home. Amen? Now you don't have to go make a fool of yourself. But it would be worth it just to open your mouth. Let me tell you about Jesus and what he did for me and how he saved me. We go on and we begin to look. And there's a prophecy that's in here in chapters 14 through, or verses 14 through 16. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And these things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. These prophecies, this this account is found in all three of the synoptics. This prophecy is found in two of the synoptics, or at least this quotation of this prophecy And each one of the Gospels has a little differing level of detail, but each tells the same story. Each provides the same account. And all of them, all four of them, talk about the colt that he's riding on and how he enters into Jerusalem. This was another indication of how a king would enter into his capital. Now, Zechariah is the prophecy that's quoted, Zechariah 9.9. And Zechariah was a prophet that lived about 500 years before Jesus entered into the city. And so here he is. Zechariah is a well-dated letter. In the very first line of chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The eighth month of the second year of Darius... This was Darius, the king of Persia, who lived in 521 uh, B.C. to 486 B.C. And so the eighth month of Darius' second year would be October 520 B.C. So somewhere around that time, Zechariah is writing this letter. 500 years before Christ came. 
detailing, detailing how Christ would enter into the kingdom, enter into Jerusalem. Detailing every aspect of it. Listen to Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He is just and endowed with salvation. He's humble and he's mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was not just any donkey. This was an unridden donkey. This was a colt. And, and any of y'all that have ever ridden horses, do you just jump on the back of a colt? And even the, the account in the, in the synoptic gospels of how Jesus said, hey, go into Jerusalem, you're going to find a colt tied up, and you're going to tell the man, or you're going to go and grab the colt and start to take him, and if somebody says, hey, what are you doing? He, you say, the master had need of it. And they're going to say, okay, go ahead. And they're going to go get this. Jesus even told them to go in and get this colt, told them where to find it, to fulfill a prophecy written 500 years before he came. Now we know that in Isaiah that the birth of Jesus was prophesied 700 years before he came. We know that in Isaiah 53 and uh, the last part of uh, Isaiah 52, you see the account of the suffering servant, a very detailed account of the things that Jesus is going to have to go through 700 years before. And they say right there, they said, these things, the disciples, they didn't understand at first. They didn't, they didn't connect the dots. They didn't see the, the, the fact that this prophecy was part of that. But after Jesus was glorified, after he was uh, dead, buried, and resurrected, and had ascended to his Father through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden they, they went, we remember now, we understand. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies that were made about him in the Old Testament. You know, all of the prophecies about Jesus have been fulfilled, save those about his return, his second return. Somebody once told me that you couldn't convince somebody of the veracity or the truthfulness of the Bible. But if you're honest and you are a student of history and you see the, the, the way the Bible has been written and you see the accuracy of how it was recorded and how it was transmitted and you see the accuracy of the secular dates that are put in it and then you see the prophecies that are made about it and then you take Jesus and you begin to try to fit Jesus into those prophecies, he fits like a hand in a glove. And you have to be, well, disingenuous not to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the king. And he is bringing salvation now. Even today, he is bringing salvation to you and I. It just, I, I've been a Christian for a long time. And it never ceases to amaze me when I read passages like this and see the detail with which God the Father went in outlining the plan that he had and the love that he showed us when Christ came and lived on this earth and went to that cross willingly for you and I that didn't deserve it. It amazes me. And I can't shut up about it. I, I can't not be amazed about it. And so you see that this prophecy talks about him coming, riding on this colt, seated on a donkey. And the disciples, they figured it out after the fact. Church, have we figured it out yet? Are you amazed at what God has done? Are you amazed at this treasure that he's given us called the Bible? Is it something you can't get enough of? Because I guarantee you, the more you read it, the more dots become connected. And the more you see the truthfulness of God's word and the faithfulness of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, the more you read it, the more you're encouraged. And so you see his popularity is at its zenith. It is at its height. 
You, you look at that, and this is, this is right after Lazarus' resurrection. This is right after Jesus has called Lazarus out of the tomb. And people have heard about this. The event of Lazarus' resurrection was big news. You know, today, how many of y'all watch, well, it's not cable news anymore, but how do you watch the, how many of y'all watch the 24-hour news channels anymore? We can get news on India, for goodness sakes. They tell us about something that happens in Thailand, and they tell us all of these different things, and, and the news cycle is, is considered to be a 24-hour news cycle, and we get news all the time. And in fact, when it first started, everybody was glued to their TVs going, ooh, wow, wow, we're getting all this news. And now it's just like, oh, okay, that's just the news of the day, and we go on. Have you, ever, have you found yourself just kind of being like that? In fact, you don't even want to listen to the news anymore because a lot of times it's bad news. Well, imagine in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. There was no sports cast, so they weren't going to get the latest on the rockets. They weren't going to hear about the Astros. They weren't going to know about J.J. Watt being trans, uh, traded. They weren't going to have all this other news cycle to, to distract them. They knew that they were heading to Jerusalem for the Passover, and all of a sudden, the whispers in the crowd began. Did you hear about this guy, Jesus? He raised Lazarus from the dead. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. I was there. He raised Lazarus from the dead. The guy was stone cold in the tomb. They had rolled the, the, uh, the stone in front of it, and he was done. In fact, it was four days after he died. Four days? Really? Man, he probably stunk. Well, that's in the account. I'm just going by what the account said. Did you hear about this? And don't think because it was 2,000 years ago and they didn't have the internet, didn't have cell phones, didn't have uh, any mass forms of communication that they were backward and that, that, that communication didn't travel. Jesus had been talked about for three years now. They knew about the miracle of turning water into wine. They'd even heard reports about him raising a little girl, Jairus' daughter. They knew about him cleansing lepers. They knew about what he had done. This guy was exciting to them. This guy was a celebrity. They had heard about it over and over again. Now there was a point about halfway into his ministry when all of a sudden Jesus got really real. He said, listen, unless you get rid of everything and follow me, unless you uh, allow yourself to die and be reborn, you can't follow me. And, and the Bible records that some of these sayings were a little bit too difficult for people and they kind of backed off for a while. But you know what? <laughs> Jesus always drew a crowd because they had heard about him. They'd heard about the events of Lazarus' resurrection just a few days prior. Do you remember that story? Sister sin for Jesus. Hey, Martha and Mary, Jesus, come. Your friend Lazarus is dying. And Jesus waits two days. Two days before he heads off to go see the sisters. And when he finally arrives, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. You don't think Jesus didn't know what he was doing? And the crowd had heard. And those that had been there and had seen Lazarus come out of the tomb. I think even today, you would be amazed. Even today, it would just be something beyond your comprehension. Even though you've heard about it, even though you, you believe what God's Word says, if you were there in that moment with all the knowledge you have today and you saw Lazarus come out of that grave with the stone rolled away, still in his grave clothes, you would be in awe. And they had been there. And it said those that had witnessed Lazarus raised, they couldn't keep quiet. Verse 17, so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to testify about him. They believed, they knew, they had seen what Jesus had done. 
They had seen a man that was dead come back to life and they could not be quiet. They could not be quiet. They had to tell people. They had to testify. They were witnesses. But let me ask you a question on this Palm Sunday. Have you ever seen somebody raised from the dead? So let me ask you a second question. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have given your life to Jesus and have made a profession of faith? Then go look in the mirror. You'll see somebody who was once dead and is now alive. And your salvation is just as much a miracle as Lazarus coming out of that tomb. Can you keep quiet about it? Are you wanting to tell everybody, hey, I was dead once and now I'm alive. I was lost and now I'm found. I was in darkness and now I'm in light. I was separated from the glory of God and now I'm a part of his family. These witnesses saw Jesus' power and could not shut up. Yes, I use the S word. (laughs) We experience his power every day and you can't get us to say a word. That's not everybody. I know that's not everybody. And I'll confess, that was me at one point in my life. But how can we not testify about what Jesus has done? And you know what? Jesus always drew a crowd. And he still draws a crowd today. Yes, there are some that want to ridicule there are some that are in need there are many that have heard about Jesus and need to hear the gospel message from you I was once dead and now I'm alive I was once lost and I am now found I was once separated from a God who loved me and he came and he grabbed hold of me And I said, I never want to be away from you. And I've never been alone since. Salvation now. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the king. And there's always going to be people that oppose him. There was always going to be a protest against him. Verse 19 tells us that. And I think in my younger days, when I was more silent than I am now, when I was worried about what people might think about me, I was worried about the protest. I was worried what they would think if I began to tell them about Jesus. I was worried what they might call me if I told them about my salvation experience. Oh, you think you're just better than us. No, no, I don't. But I have found the one that's made me better. We're afraid of being ridiculed. We're afraid of the protest. We're afraid of someone saying something against us. And yet, in 1 Peter, in chapter 2, it says, and, he, and he's quoting from a psalm, Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He is going to be offensive to those that don't know him because what he does is he makes us recognize our sin and our loss and he shows us our need for him and our flesh wants to fight against that and so he becomes offensive to those that don't know him and so there was this opposition it had occurred to uh, about Jesus from the very beginning so the Pharisees said to one another look You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. All you have to do is go up to chapter 11 and the Jews are plotting how to kill him. 
The Pharisees are plotting, how do we get rid of this Jesus? When Jesus was uh, healed the, the paralytic, the four men had, the four friends had brought the guy and he, they led him down through the roof and Jesus said, listen, get up, your sins have been forgiven. The Pharisees lost their minds. Only God himself can forgive sins. And he said, listen, which is easier to say? Get up and walk or your sins are forgiven but that you might know that the Son of Man has power and authority on earth, I say to you, get up, your sins are forgiven, walk. And the Pharisees didn't get it. And they began to oppose him. He was eating with sinners. They couldn't understand that. They questioned by what authority he he conducted the actions and the, the miracles that he did. They tried to trap him in his words and never could. There had been many demands on Jesus by the Pharisees. They were asking for a sign at one point. Show us that you're the Messiah and we'll believe. And this is after he'd done miracle after miracle. Nicodemus comes to him and starts talking to him at night. And Nicodemus says, listen, I don't understand how all these things can be. I don't understand how I can return to the womb, how I can be born again. And Jesus said, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't quite understand this yet. But you will one day. They had opposed him. There was protest against him. And now the crowds are screaming for him. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And our salvation is now. And in Luke chapter 19 verses 37 through 40. They say listen you need to stop him. You need to shut them up, Jesus. You're going to make us lose our place. Rome is going to take our, our, our country away from us. We, the Pharisees, are going to lose our position. And Jesus said, uh-uh, not doing it. There's always been opposition to Jesus. People have always demanded a sign. The Pharisees here realized their failure as they begin to talk to each other. They said, listen, you see, you're not doing any good, fellow Pharisee. The world's gone after him. They recognized that they had not been successful in their opposition to him. James wrote something similar when he said, you believe in Jesus? Well, even the demons believe and they tremble because they recognize that there is no opposition to Jesus but he's still opposed. They still think they've won as they take him to a cross and they kill him. And yet for our sake, he rose again. Church, your king has come. Salvation is now. It is now. If you've tasted that the Lord is good, if you've understood that your sins are forgiven, if you know that you have a place in heaven, if you've yielded your life to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, how can you be silent? The world is in need today of hearing about a Savior who loves them. We have an opportunity today to reach into the lives of those that have found themselves hopeless, lost, abandoned, alone, without any idea of how they're going to make it through life. This whole virus, this whole thing was not a, uh, it was not a surprise to God, but it's an opportunity for His church you and I, his witnesses, to proclaim Hosanna, salvation now. The king has come. Fathers, we close this time on this Palm Sunday. I'm so grateful that you came for me. I'm so grateful that you came for Sarah. I'm so grateful that you came for our sons, Kemp and Grant. 
I'm so grateful that you came for all those that are here today. I'm so grateful that you came for all of those outside of the walls of this place today. I'm so grateful that you came for the whole world. Lord, it's up to us to be the witnesses that you've called us to be, to proclaim that salvation is available now and that the King has come. Father, I pray that we would be a church that's obedient. I pray that we would be a church that is, that, that you are evident within us, that as we walk out of these walls today, as we, as we go to our homes, to our jobs, to our uh, neighborhoods, Lord, that, that we can't keep silent. That, Father, we want to proclaim the goodness, the acceptable year of the Lord. We want to proclaim that your kingdom has come and is now on this earth and that we're a part of it and that you've commissioned us to be your ambassadors, to proclaim your message, to take the message of hope to those in need. Father, help us to do that and not to worry about the protest, not to worry about the pushback, Lord, but to see that our service for you is good and right and honorable. Lord, you're our king. We're your servants. I thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And I thank you, Lord, for your gifts to us. And Father, help us to be good stewards of all that you've given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so we come to this Palm Sunday.